So Jordan has released a new shoe every single year since 1985, but they've really focused more recently on these high performance basketball shoes for the last 20 years or so. And this Jordan 37 is the newest release and it's supposed to be faster, lighter, more breathable and optimized for jumping. So we're gonna cut it in half, run it through all of our tests to really figure out what's inside. Is it worth $185? And is it actually faster, lighter, and more breathable and optimized for jumping, or is it all just a gimmick? So like I said, the brand is Jordan. The style is the 37. They weigh 15 ounces. They retail for $185, and they're made in Vietnam. And the way that Jordan's positioned the shoe is you've got the hops and the speed lace up in a shoe that enhances what you bring to the court. The latest AJ is all about takeoffs and landings and multiple air units to get you off the ground, and our signature Formula 23 foam to cushion your impact. Up top, you'll find a layer of tough reinforced lino weave fabric that keeps you contained and leaves your game uncompromised no matter how fast you move. And there's really four things that stand out to me about this shoe that make it really unique. The upper, the carbon fiber plate, the dual zoom air packet action, and the newly formulated Formula 23 foam. So if we look at the upper first, this upper is really interesting to me because it's barely there. It's essentially a sandal because like the product listing says, it's reinforced layers of tough reinforced leno weave. Um, and we've seen the leno weave before in the previous iteration, the Jordan 36, which I'll put in the links below and wherever else. So what is a leno weave? Well, it's a weave where the two warp yarns are wrapped around the weft yarn to provide a strong but sheer fabric. And this sounds super futuristic and cool, but it's also the exact same weave they use on potato sacks. And they, they use that kind of weave on potato sacks because it's durable and more importantly, it's breathable, which is the exact same reason they decided to use this, I'm assuming, on the upper. And I think it's kind of cool how they're using really old school like weave technology that's probably been around as long as potatoes on a really futuristic looking angular shoe with carbon fiber and all this stuff. Instead of reinventing the wheel, they use what works, which is a potato sack. But does it actually work? Well, we did the puncture test at a score zero because there's no way to actually test that. And we also ran the breathability test just to show you how breathable this really is. And it's absolutely crazy how much more breathable this is than any other sneaker we've cut apart. It's, it really is like as close to a sandal as you can get without considering it a sandal. Then if we look at the rest of the shoe, you can see it has this bumper wrapping all the way around it. And you would hope that it's leather. Being a performance sneaker, you get all the benefits, the strength, the durability, the abrasion resistance but we put the lighter to it and it's clearly fake leather. So for a $185 shoe, I, I wish they would have just done real leather, you know, because looking back at the Jordan 11 with the carbon plate and the uh, patent leather, it was an important and integral part of the shoe, the durability and all those features of the leather, but in this latest iteration, no leather. And if you didn't know, the reason I know so much about leather and can grade it and I've created this whole channel was because before this channel even started, I was doing leather working in college, started a little company, and almost eight or nine years later, here we are still making those same style of products, which include our hand-stitched wallets. Most wallets use a sewing machine. That's why if you pop a stitch, the whole thing falls apart. They use really terrible leather. It's backed by fabric. That's why that, that falls apart. We use nice, thick American tan, vegetable tan leather, hand sewing it with a single needle, a single thread, two needles, exactly the way they used to sew saddles together to make those super strong. Cause if you pop one of those stitches, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. We also make our micro adjust belts that, that solve that one problem we all have of it. When you buy a belt, it fits you perfectly. It stretches out just a little bit. Now one hole's too tight, one's too loose. With our micro adjust belts, you can make a tiny adjustment to bridge that gap between the two holes to make your belt fit you perfectly. So check those products out via the link in my description. We make them by hand here in the shop out of the best leather in the entire world. So thank you guys for supporting this channel and our products. I'll put the links in the description. And then the next three points that I find really interesting are all kind of wrapped into one because the carbon fiber, the Zoom X, and the Formula 23 foam all work together to optimize the three stages of jumping, which are loading, launching, and crashing. So starting with the carbon fiber plate, this is in the midfoot to assist with the loading phase by keeping your foot from twisting in the shoe and stabilizing the platform that you're about to jump off from. And it also acts like a loaded spring because when you bend down, you drop all your weight, it's gonna compress and bend that. So as your body weight lifts off of those Zoom Air packets, it's supposed to spring you up forward even more than the carbon fiber. Because those Zoom Air packets have a ton of PSI packed into them. And that's only made possible because there's tiny little filaments that bridge to the top and the bottom of the packet, stabilizing it and, and allowing you to pump a lot more PSI in it compared to the typical air unit. It's the same concept as trying to bounce a flat basketball compared to a full basketball. The same amount of energy is going down 
but the amount of energy returning back up is vastly different because of the rebound in the full basketball, which is similar to the Zoom X, compared to the flat basketball, which is compared to more of a, a general air unit. And now that you're in the air from the launching phase, you would most people would assume that the jump is over. But what I like about what, what Jordan has done with this is they take into consideration the landing phase because they take this Formula 23 foam and use it in the heel to absorb that really hard landing during the crashing phase. And this new Formula 23 foam was allegedly designed not for responsiveness, but to absorb the impact of a jump to prevent as much shock reverberating up through your body as possible. And part of how they do this is with a true dual density outsole because this white foam you see in more of the forefoot is a 30 shore A and this yellow foam right underneath the heel is an 18 shore A. So it's a really soft foam at the heel where you don't have a lot of natural cushioning in that. All that shock in your heel goes straight up through your body and then over your arch, it's a little bit more firm, so it, it cradles your arch and prevents it from collapsing, where that is more of a flexible part of your foot where you want that support. So it seemed like a really smart and effective way of using foam to cushion the landing. And I love this concept. I think it's a really smart way of boiling down a shoe to its base function of what they're trying to get from it and prioritizing performance and optimization for each phase of the jump cycle while trying to keep it as light as possible but does it actually work? Well, we did the ball drop test on just the zoom packet and it bounced up 20 inches. It's crazy how responsive those zoom packets are. And we also ran the ball drop test and it bounced up 7.24 inches, which is surprisingly low. So not responsive and not reboundy, but that's not the goal of that foam. And the goal was to absorb that impact. And that's kind of where some of these tests, they depend on what you're trying to get from the results, if that makes sense. Because if, if you're looking for a lot of rebound, you're looking for a high bounce back. But if you're looking for shock absorption, you're looking for a lower bounce. And we also ran the bar drop test and it bounced up six and a half inches, which is right in the middle of the field. And so it seems like they've pretty well pulled it off. But then I have some concerns about the durability because if you remember, you can crack some of these carbon fiber plates. And not that you're actually gonna crack them by hand, like this ever when you're playing basketball, but it's just fun, it's fun to do. So I'm gonna stand up by the mic so you can see if I can crack it. Oh, it's pretty hard. I don't think I can crack it. Nope, I don't think I can crack that. So part of the reason that's so much harder, to, oh, I like hurt my arms doing that. The, the, half of the reason that's so hard to crack is probably better technology since the Jordan 11. It is a performance shoe, but more importantly, you can see this ridge right here that's a little reinforcement for the rigidity. But they do the same thing in sheet metal to take a really flimsy piece of sheet metal and make it rigid by creating some three-dimensional channels in it. But did all this fancy foam technology and carbon fiber actually make this shoe lighter? Well, if you compare it to the Jordan 36, which is the previous version, this shoe weighs more. And not that it's a huge amount difference, it's only two ounces difference. It's not that big of a deal, but I, find, I thought it was kind of interesting. They tried to make it lighter, but it ended up heavier. So now let's cut these things in half, see what else is on the insides. And there is allegedly something, a little cavity on the inside that has me questioning some of the structure of the shoe. So let's cut it in half. All right, we got it cut in half. We also did that puncture test to try to see if we get a PSI reading on those little air units, but I don't think the needle made it all the way in there. So let's see what's inside. <laughs> So this is that big void I was talking about that made me a little bit concerned for the shoe because the shoe has nothing supporting underneath your foot. It's concerning because there's really no support at all in the middle of your forefoot. 
And I don't think that there's a lot of weight in that area and, I, and you might not even feel it. I can't imagine they threw that in there without testing it. But to me, it just seems like a really odd thing to do, remove a little bit of foam to maybe reduce some weight at the expense of making those shoes supportive. I'm not sold on that concept, I guess is what I'm getting at. I, I'm not convinced that, that was a good move because it's just look how easy it is to push that down. All it is is the insole, a little bit of foam, and then some like the strobe or the lasting board. And then underneath that, there's your foot would just sink into it if you had happened to have pressure there. And the carbon fiber plate supports that area anyway, but still kind of strange. So did they pull it off? Did they make this shoe lighter, more breathable, and all about the jump? Well, is it light? Yes, it is clearly light. It's not as light as the Jordan 36, but it's still less than a pound. Is it breathable? Yeah, it's about as breathable as any shoe we've ever seen, and it is about as breathable as a sandal. Is it optimized for the jump? Yeah, it seems like a lot of work and time and energy went into optimizing the shoe to not only give you energy return, to soften your landing after you have a big jump. Is it worth $185? Well, for, it is a performance sneaker and it seems like it's in the right ballpark. You know, there is a lot of technology and a lot of bits and it, I'm sure it's not an easy process to make this shoe. So for $185, I think it's in the right ballpark. But is it a gimmick? Yeah, I think it is a gimmick, but I think that's what Jordan does best. To me, the more modern Jordans are like the sports car of the shoe world. It's all about optimizing on-court performance and sometimes it's at the expense of the casual wearability of them. But to me, that's what I like. I, I like that they've taken the functionality so far and done everything to such an extent that you almost don't want to wear them as casual sneakers because they are a performance sneaker. And I think that's where Jordan has found their sweet spot by making good looking, true performance sneakers. So let me know what you guys think of this shoe and your experience in it. And if you haven't seen all the other Jordan videos we've done, we've probably done like 10 other Jordan videos, the one, two, three, four, 10, the 11, the 36, there's a bunch of them. So check them out, the links in the description. And thank you guys for supporting these videos. I really enjoy these performance sneakers because we get to see where these brands are taking some of the technology for better or for worse. So thank you guys, see ya.